the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. But before us, who can be against us? He spared his own son for us and for our justification. Shall he not also freely give us all things in him? O Lord, teach me the way of thy statutes. Let us confess our sins. Almighty and everlasting God, we have heard and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We follow too much the devices and desires of our own heart. We offend against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things we ought to have done and done those things we ought not to have done. And there's no help in us. But thou, Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind through Christ Jesus our Lord. <coughs> Grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given assurance that he pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life may be hereafter pure and holy until at last we come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. In the Lord's name be praised. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. But his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham, and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalter lection is Psalm 24, verse 5. He shall receive blessing from Jehovah, all righteousness from God, the God of his salvation. The more effectually to move the minds of the Israelites, David declares that nothing is more desirable than to be numbered among the flock of God to be members of this church, 
we must here consider that in its implied contrast between the two Israelites and those who were degenerate and bastards, the more license the wicked give themselves, the more presumptuous are they in pretending in the name of God as if he were under obligation to them because they are adorned with the same outward symbols or badges as true believers. Accordingly, the demonstrative pronoun this in the following verse is of great weight or expressly excludes all that bastard generation which gloried only in the mask of external ceremonies. And in this verse which he speaks of blessing, he intimates that it is not those who boast of being servants of God, while they have only the name, who shall be partakers of the promised blessing, but those only who answer to their calling with their whole heart and without hypocrisy. It is, as we have already observed, a very powerful inducement to godliness and upright life when the faithful are assured that they do not lose their labor in following righteousness. Since God has in reserve for them blessings which they cannot, cannot fail them, The word righteousness may be explained in two ways. It means all the benefits of God by which he proves himself to be righteous and faithful towards his people and keeping his promises to them or it denotes the fruit of the reward of the believer's righteousness. Indeed, David's meaning is abundantly manifest. He intends to show on the one hand that it cannot be expected it is not to be expected that the fruit or reward of righteousness will be bestowed on all those who unrighteously profane God's sacred worship, and on the other hand, that it is impossible for God to disappoint his true worshipers, for it is a peculiar office to give evidence of his righteousness by doing them good. <laughs> for Exodus, the root. The biblical record states that Israel did not take the direct route through Philistine country to Canaan. Had she so done, Egypt did to pass the Egyptian wall, biblical sure, which protected the northeastern highways out of Egypt. This will be guarded and could only be passed with great difficulty. If she successfully crossed the border, further opposition could be anticipated from the Philistines. The discipline of the wilderness was part of God's preparation of his holy people before they were to come into open conflict with the formidable foe. Leaving Ramses in the eastern delta, the Israelites journeyed south eastward toward Sukkot. They then moved on to Etham in the edge of the wilderness where they were conscious of God's guidance, a pillar of the cloud, a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. The word Etham is derived from an Egyptian word meaning wall. It was probably part of the series of fortifications built by the Egyptians to keep out the Asiatic nomads. From Etham, they turned back and encamped at Pi, Pi Aroth. Yeah. 
described as between Migdal and the seal over against Bell as a farm. I don't see it in this picture here about Bitter Lakes. We've got a trade route across central Sinai, one across northern Sinai. <coughs> Pai Hai, Roth is probably the Egyptian word meaning house of marshes. Baal Zephon, in the name of a Semitic deity who was worshipped in Egypt. Doubtless at a shrine located at the town which bore his name. After passing Pai Hai, Roth, Israel arrived at a water. We've got a tablet here, the famous Israel tablet. A pharaoh Mernet uh, found at Thebes, mentioning the departure of the Israelites from Egypt. After passing Pi Haroth, Israel arrived at the body of water designated in the English as the Red Sea, the Yam Suf of the Hebrew text. The geography of Exodus suggests that Yam Suf, or the Sea of Reeds, formed a natural barrier between Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula, the ultimate destination of the Israelites. The topography of this region has been altered since the construction of the Suez Canal, but the Yam Suf was probably north of Lake Timna. An Egyptian document from the 13th century BC mentions a papyrus lake not far from Thomas Wright and Wilson. Filson suggests a location at the southern extension of the present Lake Menzala. The exodus from Egypt through Yom Suf made possible by direct intervention of God who caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. Israel was thus able to cross from Egypt to the Sinai Peninsula, and the armies of the Pharaoh attempted to pursue the Israelites. The Egyptians were destroyed by water, which returned to their normal course. <coughs> And now for some more action on the Egyptian route. A reconstructed line of march connects the exodus with the ancient route that joined Egypt to Arabia, known as the Darb al Hajj the modern Muslim pilgrim route. This route crosses the Sinai on a line from Suez and Elat, ancient Ezion Geber. From Ezion Geber, the Hebrews turn south along the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba in the vicinity of al Krob, where Mount Sinai is to be located. We're working on the central Sinai region there. And now for Johannine literature. Our interest here and in proper subject is the theology and the author of the literature and not of Jesus himself, whose words the author purports to record in the gospel. The question as to how far the gospel may be used as a source for teaching of the early earthly Jesus is not our present concern. It belongs to a study of the historical Jesus. But it may be taken for granted that what the author records as the teaching of Jesus can be used without scruple as a source for his own teaching. In our opinion, the fourth gospel is based on reliable traditions of the words of Jesus. But John had made these words his own, 
and wishes us to understand that he agrees with the teaching he attributes to his master. His teaching is a true understanding of the words of Jesus and legitimate development from them. Now for Genesis chapter 11. It is true that from the very beginning God manifested himself visibly to men, but in the olden time we read nothing of the appearances because before the flood God had not withdrawn his presence from the earth. Even in all he revealed himself before the flood as one who was present on the earth. And when he had established a covenant after the flood and thereby had assured continuance of the earth and human race. The direct manifestation ceased for God withdrew his visible presence from the world so that it was from heaven that the judgment fell upon the tower of Babel. And even the call of Abraham in his home in Haran was issued through his word and is to say no doubt through an inward monition. But as soon as Abram had gone to Canaan in obedience to the call of God, Jehovah appeared to him there, chapter 12, verse 7. These these appearances, which were constantly repeated from that time forward, must have taken place from heaven. For we read that Jehovah, after speaking with Abram and other patriarchs, went away, went up, and the patriarchs saw them sometimes while walk, in a walking condition, in a form discernible to their bodily senses, sometimes in visions, in a state of mental ecstasy, or at other times in the form of a dream. Chapter 28, on the form in which God appeared in most instances, nothing is related. But in chapter 18, it is stated that three men came to Abram, one of whom is introduced as Jehovah, while the other two are called mighty angels. Besides this, we frequently read of the appearances of the angel of Jehovah, or of Elohim, the angel of Elohim, which were repeated throughout the whole of the Old Testament, and even occurred through the only envision in the case of the prophet Zechariah. The appearances of the angel of Jehovah cannot be essentially different from those of Jehovah. Jacob describes the appearance of Jehovah at Bethel as an appearance of the angel of Elohim, or the God of Bethel, and his blessing on the sons of Joseph. The God of Elohim, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, which fed me all my life long unto this day. The angel which redeemed us from all evil, Bless the lads. He places the angel of God on a perfect equality with God, not only regarding him as the being to whom he had been indebted for protection all his life long, but entreating from him a blessing upon his descendants. Now for Judges 6, the Midianites and Gideon, verses 11 through 32, call of Gideon to be the deliverer of Israel. As the reproof, reproof of the prophet was intended to turn the hearts of the people once more to the Lord their God and deliverer, so the manner in which 
God called Gideon to be their deliverer and rescued Israel from the oppressors through his instrumentality was intended to furnish the most evident proof that the help and salvation of Israel were not to be found in man, but solely in their God. God had also sent their former judges. The spirit of Je Jehovah had come upon Othniel, so that he smote the enemy in the power of God. Ehud had put the death of the hostile king by stratagem and then destroyed his army. And Barak had received the command of the Lord through the prophetess Deborah to deliver his people from the dominion of their foes and had carried out the command with her assistance. But Gideon was called to be the deliverer of Israel through an appearance of the angel of the Lord to show him that all Israel, that Jehovah, the God of the fathers, was still near at hand to all his people and could work miracles as in the days of old, if Israel would only adhere to him and keep his covenant. The call of Gideon took place in two revelations from God. First of all, the Lord appeared to him in a visible form as an angel in which he had already made himself known to the patriarchs and summoned him in the strength of God to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Midianites. He then commanded him in a dream of the night to throw down the father's altar at Abel and to offer a burnt offering to Jehovah his God upon an altar erected for the purpose in the first revelation, the Lord acknowledged Gideon. In the second, he summoned Gideon to acknowledge him as his God. Verse 11 to 24, appearance of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, Jehovah, in a visible self-revelation in human form, appeared this time in the form of a traveler with a staff in his hand sat down under the terebinth tree in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abbey Ezrite. It was not the oak, but Ophrah that belonged to Joash, as we may see from verse 24, where the expression Ophrah of Abbey Ezrite occurs. According to Joshua 17.2 and 1 Chronicles 7.18, Abbey Ezer was a family in the tribe of Manasseh. And according to verse 15, it was a small family of that tribe. And now for Isaiah 10, 5 through 19, I believe, yes. Assyria will get it as it coming. See how the king of Assyria in his pride magnified himself as his own master and pretended to be absolute and above all control to act purely according to his will and for his honor god ordained him for judgment even the mighty god established him for correction habakkuk 112 to be an instrument of bringing his people to repentance Albeit he means not so, nor does his heart. Now we turn to Prof. Jameson. Lord, Lord, do we not do all these things in thy name? Jesus returns to Sarita, responds to them. Depart from me, ye law workers of iniquity. Here they claim miracles. They're selected as three examples of the highest services rendered to the Christian cause. Though the power of Christ's own name invoked for that purpose himself to responding to the call. And his threefold repetition of the question each time in the same form. 
<coughs> expresses the liveliest manner of astonishment of the speakers at the view now taken of them, and then I will profess unto them. I'm allowed Geso openly proclaim, tearing off the mask, I never knew you. We will pick that word later. Now we are in Acts. One, one to five. The truth of Christ's resurrection is maintained and evinced that part of what was related in the former treatise was so material that it was necessary to be on all occasions repeated. The great evidence of his resurrection was that he who should show himself alive to his apostles. They were honest men and one may depend upon the testimony. The question is whether they were not imposed upon as many, well, any man is. The proofs were infallible. Te tecmeria, plain indications. And in verse 3, to, the, he, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, both that he was alive, he walked and talked with them, he ate and drank with them, and that he was himself and not someone else. He showed himself to them again and again. The marks, the wounds that were in his hands, in his side, and on his feet which was the utmost proof of the thing was capable of that was required. Now for Prof. Hodge on Romans 5, verse 18. Instead of rendering DNS paraptomatus by the offense of one, or oi enas dikaiomatus by the righteousness of one. A large class of commentators render them by one offense, by one righteousness. This does not materially alter the sense, and it is favored by the absence of the article before enas. In verses 17 and 19, it is to enos, the one. In favor of the version in our English translation, however, it may be urged that enos, throughout the whole context in verses 12, 15, 17, and 19, is masculine, except in verse 16, where it is opposed to the neuter palon. The omission of the article is sufficiently accounted for from the fact that the one intended Adam had been before distinctly designated. The comparison is between Adam and Christ rather than between the sin of the one and the righteousness of the other. The expression one righteousness is awkward and unusual. And if enas dikaiomatis be rendered by one righteous act, that it is inappropriate inasmuch as we are not justified by the act of Christ, but by his whole life of obedience and suffering. The natural opposition between one and all requires in us to be masculine. It was by the offense of the one man that all were condemned. <clears throat> that the apostle here again teaches that there is a causal relation between the sin of Adam and the condemnation of the race. Does this mean that the offense of one was simply the occasion of all being condemned, or that it was the ground or reason of their condemnation? It is, of course, admitted that the proper force of dia, the genitive is by means of, 
and with the accusative on account of as the genitive and not the accusative is used here it might seem that the apostle designedly avoids saying that all men were condemned on account of the offense of one but there's no necessity for departing from the ordinary force of the preposition of the genitive in order to justify the interpretation given above no man doubts that when in verse 12 the apostle says that death was by means of sin he means that it was on account of sin in chapter 324 we are said to be justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus so the familiar phrase is through his blood Ephesians 1 7 Colossians 1 20 through his death Romans 5 10 Colossians 1 22 by his cross Ephesians 2 16 by the sacrifice of himself through the offering of the body of Jesus and in many similar expressions the preposition retains the proper force with the genitive as indicating the means and yet the means from the nature of the case is the ground or reason thus also in this immediate connection we have the expressions by the righteousness of one all are justified and by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous we have therefore in this single passage no less than three cases in which the preposition of the genitive indicates such a means to an end as the ground or reason of which something is given or performed. And now for our Pythagorean society. The Pythagorean society represents the spirit of religious revival which are combined with a strongly marked scientific spirit, the latter, of course, being the factor which justifies the inclusion of the Pythagoreans in the history of philosophy. There is certainly common ground between Orphicism and Pythagoreanism, though it is not altogether easy to determine the precise relations of the one to the other and the degree of influence that the teaching of the Orphic sect may have had on the Pythagoreans. In Orphicism, we certainly find an organization in communities bound together by initiation and fidelity to a common way of life, as also the doctrine of the transmigration of souls, a doctrine conspicuous in Pythagorean teaching and it is hard to think that Pythagoras was uninfluenced by the Orphic beliefs and practices, even if it was with Delos that Pythagoras is to be connected, rather than with Thracian Dionysian religion. The view has been held that Pythagorean communities were political communities, a view, however, that cannot be maintained at least in the sense that they were essentially political communities, which they certainly were not. Pythagoras, it is true, had to leave Croton for Metapontum on the instance of Cylon. But it seems that this man can be, this can be explained without having to suppose any specifically political activities on the part of the Pythag part of Pythagoras in favor of any party. The Pythagoreans did, however, obtain political control in Croton and other cities of the Magna Graecia. And Polybius tells us that their lodges were burnt down and they themselves subjected to persecution, perhaps about 440, 430 BC, 
though this fact does not necessarily mean that they were essentially political rather than religious. Calvin ruled at Geneva, but he was not primarily a politician. Professor Stace remarks, when the plain citizen of Cortona was told not to eat beans, and that under no circumstances could he eat his own dog, this was too much. Though indeed it is not certain that Pythagoras prohibited beans or even all flesh as articles of food. Aristoxenus affirms the very opposite as regards beans. Burnett, who is inclined to accept the prohibitions as Pythagorean, nevertheless admits the possibility of Aristoxenus being right about the taboo on the beans. The society received after some years and continued in its activities in Italy, notably at Tarentum in the first half of the 4th century, Articus won for himself a reputation. Philolaus and Eurytus also worked in that city. And we turn now to the interpretation of the Bible. The Counter-Reformation also made a contribution to the revival of sound exegesis. At the time when Apocalypse was too often used as an arsenal of weapons to be used in the Reformation, cleavage by one side against the other. F. Ribera and L. Oscar went back to the earlier Christian fathers to find a more satisfactory method of interpreting that book. On the reform side, the first exegete to abandon the identification of Antichrist with the papacy was the Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, whose annotations on the Novum Testamentum were so objective that he was criticized for rationalism. And now for Charles Hodge dealing with objections to verbal plenary inspiration. In this respect, as in all others, Bible stands alone. It is enough to impress any mind with awe when it contemplates the sacred scriptures filled with the highest words, speaking with authority in the name of God, and so miraculously free from the soiling touch of human fingers. The errors, in matter of fact, which skeptics search out bear no proportion to the whole. No same, same man would deny that the Parthenon was built of marble even if here and there a speck of sandstone should be detected in its structure. Not less unreasonable is to deny the inspiration of such a book as the Bible, because one writer says that on a given occasion, 24,000, and another says 23,000 men were slain. Surely a Christian may be allowed to tread such objections under his feet. Admitting that scriptures do contain, in a few instances, discrepancies with which our present means of knowledge we are unable satisfactorily to explain. They furnish no rational ground for denying their infallibility. The scripture cannot be broken, said Jesus in John 10, 35. This is the whole doctrine of plenary inspiration taught by the lips of Jesus himself. The universe teems with evidences of design so manifold, so diverse, so wonderful as to overwhelm the mind with the conviction that it has an intelligent author. Yet here and there, isolated cases of monstrosity appear. It is irrational because we cannot account for the causes to deny that the universe is the product of intelligence. 
so the Christian need not renounce his faith in the plenary inspiration of the Bible, although there may be some things above it in its present state which he cannot account for. Historical and Scientific Objections The second great objection to plenary inspiration is that it teaches what is inconsistent with historical and significant truth, scientific truth. Here again it is to remark, be remarked that we must distinguish between what the sacred writers themselves taught and said believed in what they teach. They may have believed that the sun moves around the earth, but they do not so teach. To The language of the Bible is the language of common life, and the language of common life is founded on apparent and not upon scientific truth. It would be ridiculous to refuse to speak of the sun rising and setting because we know that it is not a satellite of our planet. We still use the term, the sun is rising. We understand what it means. And now for Prof. Raymond on the Trinity in the Creeds. When the Nicene Fathers employed the phrase, they did so in order to distance the church from Sabellianism. They were saying that the Father and Son possessed distinguishing properties, diotetis, which will allow the Father and the Son simply to be revelational modes, by the, which the one undifferentiated divine monad manifested himself to his creation. The Father is alone, unbegotten, I said. The Son, however, is begotten by the Father and that by an act of eternal generation on the part of the Father, but in the sense that the Son is begotten, not made. What does all this mean precisely? It means that the Father's taught that the Son derives his essential being or existence as God from the Father, see there out of the being of the Father, through an always continuing and yet ever complete act of begetting, begetting on the Father's part. Francis Turretin Institutes of Electric Theology. Third topic, question 29, argues that the doctrine is also taught and proven Psalm 2-7, several other verses. His exegesis, however, is everywhere, it is every point more assertive than argumentative and probative, more scholastic than biblical. Excuse me for a minute. The sun must not be freighted with Western ideas of source of being and superiority on the one hand and of subordination on the other. <clears throat> Whether they, rather, they should be viewed in a biblical sense as denoting the sameness of substance, and in Jesus' case, equality with the wistful Father with respect to his deity. Very challenging section as we turn to Burkhoff. In the state of the soul after the death of conscious existence, talking about the teaching of the scriptures on this point, and the doctrine of the soul sleep, psycho panicky. The question has been raised whether the soul after death remains actively conscious and is capable of religious and right rational action. This has sometimes been denied on the part of the general ground that the soul in its conscious activity is dependent upon the brain. 
and therefore cannot continue to function when the brain is destroyed. But as already pointed out in the preceding, the cogency of this argument may well be doubted. It is, to use the words of Dahl, based on the error of confusing the worker with his machine. From the fact that the human consciousness in the present life transmits its effect again through the brain, it does not necessarily follow that it cannot work in any other way. In arguing for conscious existence of the soul after death, we place no reliance on the phenomena of present-day spiritualism and do not even depend on philosophical arguments, though these are not without force. We seek our evidence in the Word of God, and particularly the New Testament. The rich man and Lazarus converse together, Luke 16, 19-31. Paul speaks of the disembodied state as being at home with the Lord, and as something to be desired about the present life. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9, Philippians 1, 23. Surely he would hardly speak after that fashion about an unconscious existence, which is virtually non existence. In Hebrews 12, 23, believers are said to come, the spirits of the just made perfect which certainly implies their conscious existence. Moreover, the spirits under the altar are crying out for vengeance on the persecutors of the church. Revelation 6, 9, and the souls of the martyrs are said to reign with Christ. Revelation 24. The truth of the conscious existence of the soul after death has been denied in more than one form. The doctrine of the sleep of the soul, psychopanarchy, statement of the doctrine. This is one of the forms in which the conscious existence of the soul after death is denied. It maintains that after death, the soul continues to exist as an individual spiritual being, but in a state of unconscious repose. Eusebius makes mention of a small sect in Arabia that held this view. During the Middle Ages, there was quite a few so-called psychopanicians, and at the time of the Reformation, this error was advocated by some Anabaptists. Calvin even wrote a treatise against them entitled Psychopanicia. In the 19th century, this doctrine was well held by some Irvingite, Irvingites in England, and in our day it's one of the favorite doctrines of the Russellites or Millennial Donists. According to the latter body, the soul, body and soul descend into the grave, the soul in a state of sleep, which really amounts to a state of non-existence. What is called the resurrection is a reality of new creation. During the millennium, the wicked will have a second chance. But if they show no marked improvement during the first hundred years, they will be annihilated. If in that period they give evidence of some amendment of life, their probation will continue, but only to the end in annihilation. If they remain impenitent, there is no hell, no place of eternal torment. The doctrine of the sleep of the soul seems to have particular fascination for those who find it hard to believe in a continuance of consciousness apart from the corporeal organism. And now we were on Tertullian, but now Minicius Felix, author of the Octavius second or third century, apparently an African. He wrote in Latin in elegant defense of Christianity in the form of a conversation between Octavius, a Christian, and Caecilius, a pagan, who was converted by the argument. 
The book refutes the common charges against Christians, argues for the case against monotheism and providence, and attacks pagan mythology, but says little of specifically Christian doctrines. It is probably a third century work dependent on Tertullian's Apology, 197, though some scholars believe it to be Tertullian's source. Now, we praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, holy, holy, holy. Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine honorable true and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the comforter. Now for discussion of James, the brother of our Lord. The apocryphal James of the Ebionitic fictions, undoubtedly from Jerusalem, the theocratic metropolis. Excuse me. There is no trace of Gentile Christians or any controversy between them and Jewish Christians. The epistle is perhaps a companion of the original gospel of Matthew for the Hebrews, as the first epistle of John was such a companion of the gospel. It is probably the oldest epistle of the New Testament. The date of composition is as yet an unsolved problem and critics vary between 45 and 62. <coughs> Schneckenberger, Neander, Thirsch, Herther, Wolfman, Wife, and Bachelard, and among English divines, Alfred and Bassett, who however wrongly vindicates the epistle of James to the son of Zebedee, and plump their assignment a very early date before the Council of Jerusalem, and the circumcision controversy, to which there is no allusion. On the other hand, Lamb, Devet, Weissner, Lang, Evald, and other commentators who see the epistle, a polemical reference to Paul and his teaching, bring it down to 62. At all events, it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem, which would have been noticed by a later writer. The Tübingen School, Bauer, Schweiger, Hick, Hilgenfeld, deny its genuineness in a sign of 80 or 90. Renan admits the genuineness of the epistles of James and Jude as counter manifestos of Jewish Christianity against Paulinism and accounts for the good Greek style by the aid of Greek, a Greek secretary. It represents, at all events, the earliest and meagerest, that's a crummy word, shaft, yet an eminently practical and necessary type of Christianity with prophetic earnestness, proverbial sententiousness, great freshness, and in fine Greek. It is not dogmatic, but ethical, thanks, Sheriff. It has an strong resemblance to the addresses of John the Baptist and the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, and also the book of Ecclesiastes and the wisdom of Solomon. It never attacks the Jews directly, but still less St. Paul, at least not his genuine doctrine. It characteristically calls the perfect law of love, lib, perfect law of liberty thus connecting it very closely with the Mosaic Dispensation, yet raising it by implication far above the perfect law of bondage. 
the firm in part and deny in part. Now for the protest against papal corruptions. The shocking immoralities of the popes called forth strong protests, though they did not shake faith in the institution. A Gallican synod deposed Archbishop Arnulf of Reims as a traitor to King Hugo Capet without waiting for an answer from the Pope and without caring for the Isidorean decretals of 991. The leading spirit of the Synod, Arnulf, Bishop of Orleans, made the following bold declaration against the prostitution of the papal office. <clears throat> Looking at the actual state of the papacy, what do we behold? John 12 called Octavian wallowing in the sty of filthy concupiscence, conspiring against the sovereign whom he had recently crowned. Then Leo VIII, the neophyte, chased from city by this Octavian and that monster himself after the commission of many murders and cruelties, driving by the hand of an assassin. Next we see the deacon Benedict, though freely elected by the Romans, carried away captive into the wilds of Germany by the new Caesar Otho I and his Pope Leo. Then a second Caesar, Otho II, greater in arts and arms than the first succeeds. And in his absence, Boniface, a very monster of iniquity, reeking with the blood of his predecessor, mounts the throne of Peter. True, he is expelled and condemned, but only to return again and redden his hands with the blood of the holy bishop, John 14. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ, thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb. Thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest on the right hand of God the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servant whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. Amen. Now for Kelvin and his liturgy. The order of public service in Kelvin's congregation at Strasbourg was as follows. The service begins with an invocation confession of sin, and brief absolution. Then followed a reading of the scriptures, singing, and free prayer. The whole congregation, male and female, joined in chanting the psalms, and thus took an active part in public worship. While formerly they were but passive listeners and spectators. This was in accordance with the Protestant doctrine of the general priesthood of all believers. The sermon came next, and after it, a long general prayer and the Lord's Prayer. This service closed with singing and with the benediction. And now for some grand action in 1534. Probably even before these measures received the royal assent, the king acted on this new clarification of the royal prerogative a draft commission dateable to mid-November or early December names three men, Cromwell, and two civil lawyers, John Tregonwell and Thomas Bedell. They were, they were to be visitors not simply to exempt religious houses, but to the whole list of ecclesiastical institutions from cathedrals downwards, which meant, in effect, the entire Church of England. The trio were named with titles which would resound through the 
Church of England for the rest of the decade. Vice Gerentis et Vicarius Nostris Generales. Among them, Cromwell was already engaged as the senior. Yet, in one course of drafting, alterations were made to produce a final commission in January 1535, which named Thomas Cromwell as the sole vicegerent or vicar general. Still, the purpose of this new office remained one single royal visitation, although this apparent limitation of powers was not what it seemed. While the vicegerent engaged on his visitation, all authority of the local bishop should be placed in the visitor's hands. This was to be the basis for the great expansion of vicegerential powers until they overshadowed those of the two archbishops themselves. Nevertheless, Dr. Logan has noted the hesitancy with which this proposed structure was put in place. Months elapsed before the commission had acted. One can underline his point by noting the way in which Cranmer's visitation staggered on into 1535, creating more problems and embarrassments in its wake. It looks as if Cromwell had not yet decided that the arch Episcopal visitation was a lost cause. New areas of visitation were attempted. In late February and early March, the age of Bishop of Vesey of Exeter received Cranmer's inhibition. And although he does not seem to have made a formal protest, the inhibition became tangled up with rows at two monasteries in Exeter Diocese. There was even an unprecedented effort to give secular backup to Cranmer's work. By placing his senior household officers on the commission of the peace in strategic areas. This is the only plausible explanation of the sudden appearance in certain county commissions of peace issued in late 1534 and winter 1535 of John Goodrich, Henry Hatfield, and Henry Stockworth. Goodrich, besides being Cranmer's treasurer, was elder brother to Cranmer's old friend and ally, Thomas Goodrich, while the Archbishop Surveyor Hatfield and Stockworth were also Cranmer's relatives from the East Midlands. The trio is listed together as a block in such widely dispersed counties as Sutri in Sussex, Suffolk in Gloucestershire, while Goodrich alone appears in the Norfolk Commission, 24 November 1534. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Westminster Confession, Chapter 5, Paragraph 1. It pleased God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and greatness, in the beginning to create and make of nothing the world and all things therein whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. For the creeds of Christendom on the formula of Concord. Speaking of 
Melanchthon. This is the account of his synergism, so-called by his opponents. It resembles indeed semi-Pelagianism in maintaining a remnant of freedom after the fall and furnished a basis for negotiations with moderate Romanists. But it differs from it materially in ascribing the initiative and the whole merit of conversion to God's grace. He never gave up the doctrine of justification by free grace and the sole merit of Christ through faith. Yes, he did. But in his latter years, he laid greater stress on the responsibility of man in accepting or rejecting the gospel and the necessity of good works as evidence of justifying faith. As to the Lord's Supper, he at first fully agreed with Luther's view under the impression that it was substantially the old Catholic doctrine held by the fathers for whom he had great risk of regard, especially in matters of uncertain exegesis. He says he endeavored to prove the argument of the fathers with Luther in Sententiae Patrum de Quaena Domini, March 1530. He there quotes Cyro, Chrysostom, Theophylactus, Hilary, Cyprian, Irenaeus, Ambrose, and John Damascus and labors to bring Augustine on his side, but with difficulty, as he says that the body of Christ is uno loco esse. And he admits that some passages of Jerome, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Basel might be quoted against Luther. He shared the disl his dislike of Zwingli's theological radicalism and was disposed to trace it to a certain insanity. But his deeper and long continued study of the subject and his correspondence and personal cor intercourse with Busser and Calvin gradually convinced him that St. Augustine and other fathers favored a figurative or typical interpretation of the words of the institution, and that the scriptures taught a more simple, spiritual, and practical doctrine than either transubstantiation or consubstantiation. In this respect, the learned dialogues of Oikolampadius, 1530, directed against the Lutheran sententiae, made it this sided impression on his mind. He found great diversity of views among the fathers, but strong proofs for the figurative interpretation in Augustine, Tertullian, Origen, and all those who speak of the Eucharistic elements as figures, symbols, types, and antitypes of the body and blood of Christ. God willing, tonight as we turn to our infallibilist friends in paragraphs 527 through 529, the mysteries of Christ's birth. Why do they keep saying that unless they're trying to blow some smoke at us? Yes, there's some mysteries, but you're dominating the discussion with the term. Something is going on here. Jesus' circumcision on the eighth day after his birth is a sign of incorporation into Abram's descendants. Into the people of the covenant, it is the sign of his submission to the law and his deputation to Israel's worship, in which he will participate throughout his life. This sign prefigures that circumcision of Christ, which is baptism. The Epiphany is the manifestation of Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, Son of God and Savior of the world. The great feast of Epiphany celebrates the adoration of Jesus by the wise men from the East. Together with his baptism in the Jordan and wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, 
and the Magi representatives of the neighboring pagan religions. The gospel sees the first fruits of the nations who welcome the good news of salvation through the incarnation. The Magi is coming to Jerusalem in order to pay homage to the king of the Jews shows that they seek in Israel in the messianic light of the star of David, the one who will be king of, over the nations. Their coming means that the pagans can discover Jesus and worship him as son of God and savior of the world by turning toward the Jews and receiving them the messianic promise as contained in the Old Testament. The epiphany shows that the full number of the nations now takes its place in the family of the patriarchs and acquires Israelitica dignitas are made worthy of the heritage of Israel. The presentation of Jesus in the temple shows him to be the firstborn son who belongs to the Lord. With Simeon and Anna, all Israel awaits its encounter with the Savior. The name given to this event in the Byzantine tradition. Jesus is recognized as the long-expected Messiah, the light to the nations and the glory of Israel, but also a sign which is spoken against. The sword of sorrow predicated, predicted for Mary announces Jesus perfect and unique oblation on the cross that will impart the salvation God has prepared in the presence of all peoples. Do you believe in the perfect oblation, JP2? The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, do thy, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. I beseech the Almighty God mercifully to look upon thy people, that by thy great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore, both in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no danger, <coughs> neither run into any kind of danger, but that all of our doings and thoughts may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty Father, whose kingdom is everlasting, we beseech thee of thy mercy to direct and prosper the counsels of those who bear authority in this land, that in humility and honesty they may faithfully serve the people committed to their charge. And grant, we pray thee, that religion and piety, peace and unity, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone work us great marvels, send down upon the clergy and the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, 
and that they may please thee, pour upon them the renewing grace due of thy spirit. This we ask for the sake of thy honor, of thy only Son, our Savior, our advocate and intercessor, risen to thy right hand. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. And thus promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. Godspeed.